What do you do here all day? Nothing. Watch TV. Don't you want to make anything of yourselves? What's the matter? Welcome back to Growing Up Punk, the podcast about punk rock and all of its friends. My name is David, normally joined by Aaron, uh, but we've got another interview lined up for you today. An exciting one, a really exciting one. Uh, Almost on, you could say, legendary status. We'll get there in a moment. First, we're going to go through, uh, you know, some housekeeping stuff. Go follow us on our social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, at Growing Punk Pod. You'll find uh, my ins- personal Instagram and Twitter, as well as Aaron's there as well. And you can find us on Facebook. You can find us at growingpunkpod.com. We've got blogs going on there. We've got the podcast is there, the YouTube stuff's there. It's all there. That's your hub for everything growing up punk, growingpunkpod.com. Now, our guest today, uh, as I mentioned, you could, you could maybe put it up on legendary status we're going to be uh i'm going to be chatting with brian mcturnan who is a producer he's also a musician uh he's he's had a number of bands we're going to talk about those bands his latest band be well just released uh, their debut full length uh, not too long ago just a few weeks ago actually and he's worked on some massive projects in the past as a producer which we are going to talk about some of those i'm um, not going to spoil it too much but uh he's he's worked on some pretty big records you're going to want to hear about it. And also to kick it all off, we talk about him growing up in uh, the DC hardcore scene and what that was like. Uh, speaking of legendary, that scene is kind of a scene of, of, of legend sort of thing. Anyway, that's all coming up in, uh, in just a little bit here, but yeah, go follow us at growing punk pod, growing punk pod.com. Let's get to the interview. Let's go back to the beginning. Do you remember kind of the first band or the first show or whatever it was that kind of got you into punk rock? Um, yeah, um, let's see, the first, like the first, I went to my first show when I was 10, and it was, um, it was, uh, let's see, it was Uniform Choice, Soul Side, and The Flaming Lips, actually. <laughs> right on. Which so is like, was such that a like, crazy... What, what, what drew you to the show, I guess? Were you familiar with any of those bands at first, or was it just something yeah, you wanted to do? Yeah. S- so like my brother had uh, I have an older brother that's also in bands and has been like in punk and hardcore for a long time and he had we were he was he was only 12 at the time but like then his best friend had an older sister who was dating this guy that was in this band at Wits End which was like a DC kind of like revolution summer era band that never got popular and he had introduced us to a bunch of music but then the real like thing that um enabled us to be able to go at such a young age is we had this this like crazy skinhead dude (laughs) moved in on our street and he was like his parents were like the his dad was like the ambassador from new zealand and my parents loved this guy and he was like a real badass dude and he he first took my brother to see Seven Seconds like two weeks before, and then he took us both to see to see that show. And then from that point on, it was like any punk, hardcore, any even adjacent type live music thing that I could go see, I wanted to see. And I mean, it was like from from fifth grade on, like my whole life was punk and hardcore. That's awesome. So like going to like a, a hardcore a punk show whatever at the age of 10 what what was that like because i mean like i didn't get into into the music and into shows until i was on the verge of high school but 10 years old like that's where <laughs> was it a little intimidating going i mean you know the thing is i was so young and everybody just kind of like got a kick out of that so it was like it was intimidating in the sense that like dc um where i grew up had a very violent scene there were a lot of fights and that was always really scary um but everybody was like super nice to us like you know you have like these like little kids at the show and it was you know we'd always like stand on the side of the stage or stand up front and i mean i just it was it was i probably should have been more intimidated than i am (laughs) it's funny because i have a 12 year old daughter who if i like ask her to go like 
walk to the store and get something. She's like, oh my God, by myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, yeah. Like I was like, by the time I was her age, I was like going everywhere. You know, we were going to to New Jersey and New York City and Pennsylvania to see shows in Richmond. <laughs> I mean, like uh, we were... We were we were pretty like um, feral children, I guess you would say. <laughs> so, like, I guess because you mentioned your parents liked this, you know, your your skinhead neighbor or whatever. Uh, was, were they just super cool with you heading out of town and going to all these shows, like, or was it something you just kind of did and you know? I, you know? Lit, it was it was a little bit of both. I think that they were excited that we had something that we were like so into because right. I think both 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 my brother and I had like never really gotten into like sports or yeah. you know school <laughs> you know so i think i think like clear i mean i literally i had like stacks of fanzines stacks of demo tapes like i i i, I that was a really cool time because I, I i would buy every zine i could get my hands on and then i would order every demo that was reviewed advertised whatever um and my brother actually did a fanzine with a friend of his and so we would get all this like cool shit in the mail for him to review and mm -hmm. we just got i mean it's crazy to think that like some of the people that i became like pen pals with when i was in junior high school are still like really good friends of mine yeah. now so when, i think oh go ahead i was just saying i think that's it's it's such a lifestyle i mean punk and hardcore is such a it was it is my life i mean it's yeah. not like and it's small too, especially then it was small. So it was like, you know, you, you wrote, you, you order a demo and write somebody a letter, they write you back. And then you, all of a sudden, you know, they come through on tour and stay with you. And, you know, you just make, it's a lot different than like firing off like emails and like merch stores and <laughs> paying totally. with a credit card, you know? So when would this have been, uh, like, so when you were 10, when you went to that first show, what kind of year, what, what, what Nin are we looking 19, at? 1986. 1986. Okay. So, um, and then you, uh, you mentioned you were growing up in, in like the DC scene. What was that kind of like? Cause I know you, you'd mentioned there's a lot of fights. It was pretty violent and I, it's just, it's strange to me. You know, because the scene I grew up in was very much just like, oh, it's its own thing. There was there was nothing notable about you know the scene that I grew up in outside of those of us going to the shows. So, what was that like to kind of grow up in a scene that was actually, if not nationally, internationally known? Um, I I think that I, I don't know that I fully appreciated like how cool that aspect of it was up until i remember i went and saw fugazi, fugazi at soul side and verbal assault play together at the wilson center or at this place called the wilson center in dc yeah and it was like it was like notably powerful and just like insane like it was <laughs> like it was just like out, it, that was probably the first time that it hit me that like DC was like, you know, really special and different. And we had at that point we were starting to travel and seeing shows in other places. But seeing Fugazi and and there's like um, that show is like on their DVD and it's like just watching it. It's like holy yeah. sh fucking shit. Yeah. That was <laughs> so. I, I think I think that um, the whole like East Coast felt like it was just kind of bubbling up you know like like the like all like the new jersey bands like turning point and um and release were like really doing well four walls falling was doing really well in richmond and then like all the new york bands like it just was i mean i was too young to appreciate like i i i what i would have given to be i mean it was cool that i was so young seeing all that but also like i don't I don't think I fully realized that I was like knee deep in something right. that people would be talking about for, for, for yeah. years and years to come. Yeah. Uh, so if you, I guess if you had to pick one or two, cause there's so many like legendary bands out of that scene, what were some of your, some of your absolute favorites? Obviously, I mean, you named your studio after a minor threat mm. release. Yeah. So yeah. I'm assuming they're on the list, but what are some of those bands that you just remember falling in love with? 
Well, definitely the two, I think, m- like monumental bands in my life were both from DC or Rights of Spring and Embrace. Now, I did not get to see either of those bands play. That's right. like, I literally just, we started going like the summer after. Yeah all of that happened and uh, that's like pretty heartbreaking because (laughs) that would have been pretty cool um i think like the two bands that were like that i saw probably the most that i were soulside and swizz Mm. um like they were they were like there was like the dc like discord scene and then there was like the like hardcore like new york hardcore type band right. scene and they were very separated and i went to both okay i went i went to shows on, on both sides always um and swizz and dag nasty were the two bands i mean swizz and soul side were the two bands that really kind of bridged that gap in yeah. a lot of ways like they would you know you would see swizz play i think you know with like a gorilla biscuits and soul side you know would play with hardcore bands too and uniform choice for you know but but like, like Nation of Ulysses and um, the, those kinds of bands wouldn't, wouldn't. So I think that Swizz and Soul were probably like, kind of fit my brain the best because okay. I was like equally excited about both worlds. So maybe maybe you can answer this question or maybe not. But because you said you kind of went to, um, you know, shows in the the Discord sort of scene as well as you know, like the the more hardcore scene, and and I know kind of like when when you say the Discord scene, I'm assuming you're talking about when they kind of like with the whole Revolution Summer thing when they sort of started something new because of all the violence and what have you that was going on in the hardcore scene. Could you actually notice? Was there a noticeable difference between those two kind of scenes and going to shows? Oh yeah, yeah, big time. I mean, the Discord, like the like the DC. <sighs> the more like discord side of things was much older and it was and it was like you know often those shows would be at like churches and they would often be benefits and you'd like bring a can of food at the door kind of vibe and then the hardcore shows were almost all at this place called the safari club which was like and those that was like a lot younger kids and that was like you know stage diving and dancing and you know that like just a totally different a totally different vibe entirely yeah so it's it's always kind of funny to me when you just mentioned there um some of the a lot of the discord shows happening at churches just the for whatever reason because the scene i grew up in too there were a lot of shows that happened at churches and it's just like this weird crossover of of punk and i guess just a place that's either free or inexpensive to rent right so it's just so wow yeah. What I don't, I what I don't know is I think that like this may just be like folklore, but like one of the places was St. Stephen's, and the the kind of urban legend was always that the Mackay family went to church there. Okay, and their dad had like a relationship with that place, and there are still shows there to this day. Hmm, that's um, cool. And then I also think that like Positive Force was an organization in DC is an organization Mm -hmm. in DC that did like, and I think that they must have had relationships with some of the churches as well. Um, And all of the churches where the shows were, were all in kind of one area of town. Hmm. Um, So it was cool. I mean, they were, you know, it was kind of the perfect, you know, you have that hall (laughs) and uh, you know, um, and it was cool. And I mean, it was, and then there would be some crossover, you know, from time to time, like bands would, the hardcore bands would play with some more of the, like, like that, um, Fugazi show, soul side show I was talking about, um, verbal assault played. Yeah. And, and to me, verbal assault was always like a hardcore band more. Yeah. And then they played on that show and it worked. I mean, it was yeah. hmm. very cool. So how old were you then when you kind of got into your, you started your first band? Um, well, like, um, my first like real band was, I was 1990 and I was in eighth grade and it was kind of a crazy story how it all came together. But the short version is this guy that I met, this like skinhead dude in the DC scene was always nice to me at shows and we became friends. And then when I went to middle school, I started dating his sister 
Yeah. And so I would I would go to his house after school, and he had a band called Strength in Numbers that was like kind of like us. They were good. They were like a skinhead meets youth crew kind of sound a little bit. Um, yeah. And he had also been in a straight edge band called On Edge that I really liked. And so I don't know why, but they would just let me come watch them practice all the time. <laughs> and so every day after school, I would go to their house and he'd let me play the drums or if they were practicing, I w- I'd watch. And then um, the guitar player in that band was Ken Olden, who would go on to be the guitar player in Battery, um, which was my first real band. And he, he, um, like, I kind of backed into the band in the sense that he, he ended up saying to me, like, I had gotten really in by, at the beginning of seventh grade, I, this is when I started getting, like, I, I remember I went and saw Gorilla Biscuits play. And then, like, I was, like, with a bunch of my friends, we're taking the Metro home, and one of my friends was like, you guys want to be straight edge? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds cool. <laughs> so we all, deci- we all decided to be straight edge together. So Ken, the guitar player in Strength in Numbers, I would see him at the straight edge shows, too. Mm-hmm. And we started talking, and he said to me, oh, I'm starting a straight edge band if you ever want to come see us, watch us practice. So sometimes I would like go to this girl Karen's house and then ride with Ken to his house and then watch him practice. And it really like, I mean, looking back, it was so crazy. Like I just watching them put songs together, not only like taught me how to write songs, but right. it also got my brain like just sitting there thinking like, oh, this would be cool to do. I mean, it just kind of got all of my like producer wheels right. churning. So they couldn't find a singer and i started singing at band practice just like they would do the set and then often play like the whole judge record or something right, yeah. you know like <laughs> and and i would just sing at practice and it was fun and then like towards the end of my eighth grade year they booked studio time to do a demo in order to get a singer and while we were in the studio the um the producer said to me, like I was telling him, Oh, I sing at practice. And he was like, Oh, just go out there and lay down what you do. And then I'll run it off for them both ways, you know, without vocals and with vocals. And I went and did it and it was like, awesome. (laughs) It came out really, really awesome. And then the cool thing was because I had been going to show since I was such a little kid, like I just like, brought the demo to the dude who booked shows at safari club and he put us on the sick of it all show and so like <laughs> my first real show was when i was in eighth grade uh, opening for sick of it all <laughs> <laughs> that's insane so yeah that that was nine that was 1990 so i mean that was a fucking long time ago and so that 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 is or was battery yeah so okay. that was we will we were called fury at that right. show okay. and then Jason Farrell from Swizz had had a band called Fury, and he told us we needed to change our name. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, we, we, when recording we that demo, because I mean, the band you said you sang basically like the Judge record and stuff, or when you were at practice, were you singing? Like, did you have Both. lyrics that you wrote, or what was the deal with what went on that so, demo vocal? So, so on the demo, they had lyrics that they wrote, okay. and I would sing those. Yeah. Um, so actually, on the demo, I didn't write any lyrics, and. The lyric thing ended up being the reason the band broke up in the mm. the first first time. So we actually only played a few shows, and then I I had been writing lyrics and always was writing and writing and writing. And what I wrote was a lot like like on the battery demo. There's like a song about like South Africa, and you know, right. like I yeah. mean, yeah, it just wasn't my thing. Like I grew up like in really immersed in like the like dc more like introspective lyrics and even like turning point and for uh, honestly for that matter i always felt like judges lyrics were like very personal in a Mm -hmm. lot of ways too and they just i think didn't like like the direction that i was going in and for some some reason i just didn't want to like sing stuff that didn't like i didn't feel so we actually the band actually broke up um like a few months after we started and 
I started a new band and they started Worlds Collide. Like the mm-hmm. the other guys in Battery started Worlds Collide and I started a, was called Rise and then became Ashes. So okay. um going back to cuz you said like some of the lyrics on that demo they had a song about South Africa and stuff. If I if I understand correctly like the the whole Discord scene there is there was a lot of kind of like social activist sort of stuff going on as well. Like was that something that you just never really attached to or was it like, um what? no i i did i just i mean i was young and so like i i didn't know i didn't know a lot about i didn't know a lot about that stuff yeah. and kind of w- what was what it wasn't like i wasn't interested but like what i was personally feeling you know and even even like you know a lot of those Soul side maybe saying a little bit more about political stuff, but like right to spring and embrace, which were like my kind of like records, um, were so much more personal, and that's what really like I had inside of me that I was trying to get out, and yeah. um, and you know the funny thing is they went on to do Worlds Collide, which was like super kind of metal <laughs> and <laughs> and not you know I mean it wasn't the political thing that I had you know it's so much of a thing it was just like. I, I, there's something about getting up on stage and like singing someone else's words that sure, just yeah just wasn't that inspiring to me. And I I I think I was innocent enough. I mean, I don't think I quite processed how crazy it was to be quitting such a good band when I was in ninth grade. <laughs> yeah. So, but you did get back together. We did. So that was like this crazy thing happened where. Um, like when I was a senior in high school, um, I walked into a record store and I mean, there was, this dates it pretty well, but (laughs) I don't think I even owned a CD player yet. And I, and I walked in this record store and I saw that there was a battery CD and I was like, what the fuck? And I looked (laughs) at it and it had all our songs on it and it had some really crazy weird artwork and I now know that my brother and Ken, the guitar player, actually gave them to p- permission to put it out. But at the time, I thought it was a bootleg. And I think they told me it was a bootleg because they didn't want to get in trouble for right. giving permission without. And I think nobody ever thought anything would come of it. But what actually happened was this label in Germany put it out and the band started was doing really well there. And um, th- th- when I was like, wow, this is so cool. The guitar player was like, yeah, I talked to the guy and if we want to do an album, he'll put it out. And so I ended up dropping out of school, recording this battery record, and then went to tour in Europe when I was 17. I was going to say, so how old were you when you went on? And so your first tour, not only were you still, because you did you drop out of high school to do it? Yeah, well, actually, my first tour was with this band I was in called Ashes. We went to the West Coast when I was like 15. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that, it was it was crazy. And like, we we were doing really well, actually. And we, we went to the West Coast and played with like Sensefield, Game Face, Farside, uh, Outspoken, Strife, like every cool West Coast band in that world you could imagine we right. played with. And um, <laughs> it was super fucking cool. And... So I was doing that, and Ashes was doing actually really, really well in in really super well in DC, but also like nationally we had recognition. But the battery thing, I mean, the, it just was like, you know, it was like they were like cool with me writing the lyrics, and this, you know, I had hardly ever, tr- I never left the country, so I mean. It just felt like a really cool opportunity, and I was such a fuck up in school that it just it didn't it didn't matter, <laughs> right? I, you know, it were, just didn't. Were matter. you gonna graduate? Do you think? <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I think I think so. I mean, yes, I I, I would have graduated. I right. was passing, but I had been kicked out of school like. Uh, two or three times and like uh, when i actually like sat and talked to my guidance counselor about it she was like you should do it because (laughs) your transcript you know you're better off you're just as well served with the ged and some life experience as you are a degree right um 
so yeah so we we we, we just got on a plane and just went to europe and it was insane because in 1994 i mean the like was like west germany and like i mean e- e- eastern europe was like still crazy i mean mm-hmm. it was like the wall had not been down that long and like the coolest thing was like a lot of the ve- the venues over there were like squats or like punk and hardcore people had like taken over these buildings and put in like you know whatever and it's so cool going back now because a lot of those same places are still there a lot of the same people that like ran the clubs are still involved and just like europe has like a really really incredible network of like people and venues and promoters and magazines that are all just kind of been in it for forever and really fucking get it that's cool it's seven 17 years old heading over there so i just wanted to jump back for a second because you mentioned you'd been kicked out of school a number of times like were you were you kind of a troublemaker did you have a bit of a, a, a rough childhood or was it just yeah 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 it was it was i mean i was doing graffiti and like you know getting in fights and hanging out with like a lot of like crazy kids and and like like i told you my my parents were like it we had a very like calling our household like chaotic would be like an understatement it was (laughs) like it was like a very very crazy like like i would just not come home for like days or sometimes Mm. weeks at a time and it was just like you know it was not like a stable situation and then like because of that i mean i the kids that i went to school with were really really nice kids but i always felt like kind of an alien around them they had like really nice like put together families and like their houses were very tidy and organized and i felt like my i just was like from another planet so i kind of definitely gravitated towards some kids that were like a little bit rough around the edges like right. even though i i wasn't like a mean or like a violent kid in that sense but i just fit much better with the crazy kids right right and that's man so you're on the road 17 years old you go to europe you've got this band going and then when did you decide that you wanted to start a studio and start well, recording and producing we- a big the the big change the the big inspiration with that was actually recording that battery record because we um we went to atlanta and at least this kid that we had grown up with this this uh, kid this guy isa um <laughs> he had actually like moved to atlanta taken out like gotten a bunch of credit cards and bought enough studio gear to um to have a studio and and he he was recording bands and and it was like kind of the same way that like like going to shows at a place like the safari club like the people on stage seemed not that different from me it made right. me think like oh i could do that too and then that experience of going to like a guy we grew up with who had was doing this thing that was so exciting to me it made me think like you know what like I could, you know, if, if not like if Isa could do it, I could do it, but like it seemed attainable. And, mm-hmm. um, and so then actually after the battery tour, um, in Europe, I came back and my band Ashes went down to Atlanta to record with, with, with Isa. And that was the first time, like I got more involved. Like I remember sitting behind the console, like touching the faders and like, recording vocals and and i was just like man this is it <laughs> this is what i want to do so and then so it started because you, you didn't start you moved and started the studio is that right because you're yeah, from so, maryland originally right yeah so like the the drummer and ashes matt squire who's a incredibly successful music producer now he had he had an eight track studio in his basement and we we always recorded all the time and Mm -hmm. um and then after the atlanta experience i had i ended up the two of us i took i i bought some equipment like and we put it at his mom's house and started recording bands so 
I was recording some, I guess the initial salad days was kind of in Matt's mom's basement in a sense. Okay. And, <laughs> and then, and then everybody in ashes was like moving to the Northeast to go to college. And then my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time was going to Boston to go to Harvard. So I was like, I had some friends in Boston and I just was like, Oh, I'll move to Boston and start a studio. I mean, it seems so like, <laughs> yeah, like why not? And, and I did. And so I, I moved into a house with like five or six other people. And like, I had like a mattress on the floor in the dining room and the, basement the cellar it's i set up the studio and that was it that was the beginning of salad days that's awesome now you've over the years have worked with some pretty pretty notable bands and some pretty notable projects so i thought we kind of maybe if you're cool with it if we kind of quickly go through some that sure um, that are that are memorable or even ones that because you worked on some albums that are pretty memorable to me but let's start with early on you worked with texas is the reason they're kind of one of those like short-lived but quite influential, like post-hardcore emo band sort of things. What do you remember about working, you know, kind of with them? Um, that was probably like, that was the breakthrough for me. That was like the thing that really like put me on the map in a sense. And the funny thing about that um, recording was nobody had any expectation that that would ever come out. Like they were just friends of mine, like Ashes had played with, um resurrection chris daly was the drummer of and and then we had played with shelter and norm the guitar player was in shelter and then i had known garrett the singer from shows and so when they had a new band they just wanted to come up and do a demo and it was just like a good excuse to hang and <laughs> i don't think anybody anticipated that it would come out as well as it did <laughs> right and and then we didn't ever even like really mix it we just kind of like like a, did a rough mix and then like a couple weeks later i got a call like oh um revelations putting it out and we need to send it to mastering and i was like whoa <laughs> that's, that's pretty, pretty cool like could you tell there was something a little oh yeah i mean it was there? it was so good and it was like everything about it was cool like i just remember like I think it was like one of the first times I had heard a band in like my world playing in drop D mm. like that, that tonality that, that they had. Um, but I, I, I don't know why. I mean, I thought it sounded like turning point. Like that's, I just mm. remember thinking that that's what I thought. Like it was like a more emo rock turning point. And now I don't think that at all. I mean, now I just think like, Oh, that sounds like Texas is the reason. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. But I mean, it was kind of a sound that I hadn't ever heard. So I was just like finding the closest um, thing that I could, yeah. that I thought I, that, but yeah. That's, that's cool. So uh, you, you've also had like some bands that you've worked with on a number of projects. So Strike Anywhere. How did that relationship kind of get started? Oh, they're, they're like my favorite band of all time. Um, <laughs> I love those guys. They're, they, um they so i met ashes thomas used to sing in a band called inquisition and a a ashes played with inquisition in richmond and i just remember being like this guy's fucking voice is so cool like mm -hmm. i i mean it's pretty he has a unique and notable approach and I just felt like, oh man, this dude sounds like Kevin Seconds meets like a veil. Like this is the coolest shit ever. And, um, but I didn't know him well, but then I had done a record for, um, their Garth, the bass players band count me out. Like I had done a single for them. And I just remember, um, when strike anywhere got together, Garth came up to me and gave me like the demo and was like, Hey dude, like I, this is my new band with Thomas from Inquisition. And I was like, Holy fuck. And <laughs> I put it on. And I mean, I, it's like, it was like the music that God made for me. <laughs> <laughs> I just play. like, I, I, I just felt like this is like gorilla biscuits meets avail meets seven seconds with like four walls falling lyrical tendency. Like, everything that i loved about like punk and hardcore was like just right. 
melded together on that demo and um and then i was super psyched about it and then like you know i'm not ever like the kind of person that's gonna like like go after doing a band you know like like mm. to pitch myself or whatever and but i was like god i would love to record these guys and one day garth called me and was like oh we have to do a um seven inch for fat um would you be interested and that they came in and i think that was in 1999 mm -hmm. and um i've recorded everything of theirs since so i think oh, we've done incredible. four full lengths and two eps yeah so like you did you did the ep that came out of theirs earlier this year then yep yep yeah. so I do did. you have any kind of is there is there a record out of those that you've worked on that was your favorite either how it turned out or just like the process um i i i don't know i i mean i love all of them for like really different reasons and i think it's cool because they're like like i love that like changes the sound feels like it's like just about to like fly off the tracks at any point in time and then kind of like every record's almost like a reaction to the last one and the mm -hmm. exit english is then like way more kind of chunky and put together and like more under control and um and then honestly like there's the new ep i don't think I, I we had so much fun making that like it literally was like like just a i mean it was like just such a blast like thomas and i recorded all the vocals at my house and we just <laughs> would like hang out with the dogs and track vocals and then every night we'd like make dinner and watch yeah. like a punk punk documentary and i don't know like I, to have to get to be involved um with a band that is like i love that i mean there are a lot of bands that i love that much but i'm um, like like i i don't know like they're like some of my favorite people in the world they write some of my favorite songs and they're just like family you know so totally. it's like it was like it's like the, those early bands like my wife is good friends with and they've known my daughter since she was a baby and it's just there's something really special about that like you know 20 years together you know totally that 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 adds like a layer of like emotion to to that and i'm also thrilled for them that it came out so good and that people like it so much right on so, so hot water music then uh a couple records of theirs that you've worked on over the years a flight and a crash caution the new what next they really kind of polished i i want to say that was that was a, a period of time where they're really sort of polishing their sound especially caution um what do you remember about working on that record in particular that's one of my favorite records I've ever made. And I love, I love those guys. Um, and like we did, um, a flight and a crash and that was very turbulent. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I was really young and they were young and they, they're so good. And I think that like, they'd never really had anybody be like, Hey, this could be better, you right. know? And, and, and I think that like, in fairness to them, when i was younger i think like when i had suggestions you know you when you don't have like the co now i have a lot of like confidence with my ideas and opinions and know how to uh, approach it in a way like cater my approach to the artist so that it doesn't feel like they're just getting shit on right. and i think that maybe i hadn't learned the nuance of that as well so it was just a hot you know like we're like good friends but it was like a flight and a crash was like stressful and um and we ended up having this like really great heart to heart after it about kind of like all of the things that like they found stressful and all the things that i found stressful and we just kind of agreed that like if we were going to work together again that like we'd take a different approach so with caution i ended up going down to Gainesville and like hung out with them and like went to like their buddy's spot and we jammed on the songs together there and really just like you know got um got deep deep into it and um, one of my favorite memories of recording ever was one of the things like, they you know I think they had said to me like we want to have like 
be able to experiment with sounds more and if we have like weird ideas we want to do like we don't want it to be like you know we don't have time for that or whatever but and i was trying to explain to them that like if the songs aren't totally written and you're still writing lyrics when you're in the studio and writing songs when you're in the studio it adds stress that makes doing that fun stuff harder right um so i committed to them that they would that i would be like more open to like going down the rabbit holes they wanted to go to and they committed to me that they would like have it all written when they got there and the first morning of recording caution i went down to like the basement apartment where the band stayed and chris and chuck had taped all of the lyrics to the whole record to the door so like the first my first memory of starting that record was like walking up to that door and being like well <laughs> they held up there under the bargain and i mean the lyrics are unbelievable on yeah. the record it's a, it's like that's another one of those ones did you have any idea in the process like obviously you know the the experience of making the record was you said much better than the the, the one before but that's i I'd, i want to say that's one of those all-time records from you know kind of that era especially could you did you feel that going into it or yeah yeah definitely yeah i mean i i it was like every song was like a masterpiece in my opinion i mean like they were just they just still had that like rawness and energy that they always had but the yeah. songwriting was so so developed and so nuanced and the lyrics were so good and both chris and chuck i felt like were um just firing on all cylinders and like the other thing is we just had a lot of fun and yeah. it's like having an environment where you know you know the songs are great you're all getting along really well you all love each other and care about each other i mean that's you know you can't those are those are components that are just hard to compete with sure so another band that you worked with um for a couple of albums was thrice now the artist in the ambulance is one of my i, I want to say a couple of years ago you know on facebook or social media whenever they do the post you know one album a day your top 10 albums or whatever no no words no nothing just just share your, your the the album art the artist in the ambulance has always been kind of one of those records for me that's in that top 10 for sure so what kind of like i mean what do you remember about about that one coming together um um you're every every band you're talking about right now are like my favorite people so if i sound <laughs> like if, if i sound like i'm just saying like oh i love them so much that's just because you just are happening to uh <laughs> touch on the ones you love yeah. touch touch on the ones i i mean uh, let's see like well, that was an intent that was kind of a crazy time because they had signed to um island def jam and they were like the most hyped band ever and um i remember that that um there was kind of like i think everybody was feeling a lot of pressure i ended up going out there for like i want to say like three or four weeks or maybe even more doing pre-production with them just kind of not writing for them in any stretch but really kind of like just being in the room with them helping them sift through all of all of their ideas and um and then we um we actually um one of the one of the coolest things that happened with that record is there's this guy named mike barbiero that's like always been my hero as a producer engineer mixer guy and um the guys in thrice wanted to record the drums at this place called bearsville and i was like i think i was only like 24 or 25 at the time and i felt like a little intimidated by that like i felt already like this is a lot of responsibility doing this record mm -hmm. <laughs> and going to some like place i've never worked and working on a console i wasn't familiar with just was a little stressful so i ended up saying to mike barbiero hey have you ever tracked at bearsville and he was he was like oh yeah i worked there for whatever and long story short he ended up volunteering to come engineer the record oh nice the so he engineered the drums on that and like it was so cool to get to work with like someone that i had just looked up to for so so long yeah so was that your first record that you worked on that was on a major 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that was oh, go ahead. maybe one of that was maybe one of the only ones I've ever worked on that right. was on a major. So then, do you as a as a producer, like obviously there's some some pressure that you would feel in that situation, but like, do you think like you hold that pressure? the same as you know a band going into especially with it being your first kind of working on a major yeah i mean i i think if i was being like totally honest i feel like i feel like if i could go back in time and i think that like i love the record and i feel like we did a really great job um i think that like i i was taking maybe more chances with like sonics and production on other records i was working on at the time than i did on that because i felt like i was trying to be professional you know right, and yeah, now yeah. now with like the wisdom of a career of doing this like that fucking doesn't matter at all like the cooler and wilder it is the better in my opinion so <laughs> like so i feel like yeah, my only regret with that record is i, I feel like in terms of like helping them kind of curate the songs and get the arrangements together and get the vibe of the record together. I feel like I really did kill it. Um, mm -hmm. I think in terms of the actual like production kind of side of it, I, I feel like I wish I had been a little more myself and taken a little more chances um, and not been so intimidated by, you know, just trying to be professional because it right. you know it's like it's one of those things where you know like what is being a major label producer anyway right. like you know it's a funny how you can you get to a place in your life or career by doing something one way and then you feel like you have to try and morph into somebody you're not um so yeah. but but I, I i i i um that was a very very special time for me and um and uh, like man i love those guys and actually the funny thing about thrice is i if memory serves me correctly i did thrice was this band the illusion of safety was the record that came in directly after we finished strike anywhere changes the sound okay yeah and then strike anywhere exit english was the record i did directly after thrice the artist in the ambulance so oh interesting <laughs> yeah so they were stacked on yeah. both both records were stacked together yeah uh no that's artist in the ambulance still one of my one of my all times i did want to ask being since since i'm from from canada you've worked with a couple uh canadian bands and you actually did an album with one of my probably favorite if not my favorite Canadian band, I'd have to think maybe think about it a little further. But uh, you did the record, "The Red Tree" from Monin. First of all, how did how did that come how did that come together? Because it's the only record you did with them, right? Yes. So so, yeah. so that was kind of a crazy situation. Um, the um, let's see, I had done I had done a record i can't remember what it was i didn't know those guys so vagrant actually came to me and yeah. and wanted me to do the record but then it ended up it ended up being that like vagrant had never listened to the demos so like <laughs> a few days before the band was meant to come into the studio vagrant called and was like we don't like these songs like <laughs> they're <laughs> they're they're not ready to, you know, come in. And so I already had the time put aside. So I said to the dudes, like, dudes, you guys should just come down anyway. And let's just, I like the songs and I have a lot of cool ideas. And let's demo them to show Vagrant what this could be. Um, and then they came down and, um, and the, uh, it was very, very, very stressful because being in a band and having the label tell you they don't like the songs yeah. i mean i it's it adds a layer of like pressure and stress to everyone and the other thing it did is i think it made the band feel like at first like all of the um ideas that i had were like i was trying to appease the label when it was really not that at all right. um so it took it took um it took a long time to kind of earn their trust and then um 
and then um then they they went home we sent the demos to the label and the label loved them and then they came back and we made the red tree and that was a super magical experience it's like yeah i mean J J you just mentioned briefly well not briefly that whole story was about how the label wasn't happy with the demos and just the stress it kind of created i gotta say like especially for monine that being their first record on vagrant and i guess their only record technically maybe vagrant reissued some stuff but um but i can just i can only imagine going into that situation being like all right we've signed to this because vagrant at that time was pretty big. big yeah big yeah yeah and so to like to sign and, and be excited and then <laughs> the label to say, Oh, actually we don't like these. We don't think you're ready. So, um, but that, that record, the red tree for me really is, again, I mentioned this with hot water music, but there's really, you kind of like, there's a real polishing of the sound refining. Cause they're a pretty chaotic band. Uh, right. As far as, especially in their live shows and their earlier stuff kind of harness that as well. But I really felt like this record, it, it all came together so well was that a lot of stuff that was done when working on the demos or was that polishing kind of really uh, done in the studio or um, were they kind of getting there themselves i mean i so you know the, it's definitely the art of it all is kind of identifying what is it that makes this band special and what how do we take like all of these components that are so powerful and kind of put them together so it's really cohesive and 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 is like finished feeling mm -hmm. without losing the energy i mean that is the trick of it right it's like polishing it in a way that's still like frantic and yeah. emotional um i don't know i mean you know i like we worked very hard on it and, and we did some work on the arrangements but those guys just have great ideas and are a lot of fun and are all really great players and I mean, I think probably one thing as we're talking about all these great records is the chemistry you have when you all like each other and respect each other and really care about one another, it really comes across in the final product. I think I do believe that. And um, those guys were just so much fun to work with. Like yeah. Kenny, I've, they were just hilarious and like had great ideas and were like I, it's funny actually i think all the time about when we were mixing the red tree they had i think they had more mix revisions than like <laughs> any band any band i've ever had but they it would always be like hey brian this song sounds so amazing. Thank you for all your work. This was so great. I can't wait for people to hear it. It would be even better if this and this and this, and then you realize there's like 25 things. <laughs> and then you're like, but when people approach it in that way that is like friendly and kind of points out all the positives and is a reminder that it's like the revisions are coming from a place of wanting to make something that's great even better mm -hmm. it's so much easier to stomach than sometimes you'll get a mixed revision from a band and it'll be like the guitars kind of sound like shit and <laughs> then i just like want to like smash my phone on the <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so. You, you've worked with like i mentioned a ton of bands on a ton of projects do you have any just real quick that kind of jumped out almost that were surprising whether it was you know like oh i didn't realize this band was capable of this or just the overall reception and how albums did were there any that sort of jumped out and surprised you i mean uh, like i think that i don't know if things surprised me like i remember when i did this first circus survive juturna album yeah they had never even played a show so like did i anticipate i mean i thought it was fucking awesome and i loved them and but did i um think that they would go on to be you know <laughs> mm -hmm. 20, 20 years later selling out like the biggest venues in the world be one of the most important bands like no i didn't know that i mean i knew it was good and i knew i liked it but it's been pretty exciting to watch that unfold yeah um a lot of the a lot of the um a lot of the early bands like i think a lot about like bane um was like such a cool thing for me because it was like i recorded them i recorded their first demo and then their first seven inch and then like kind of like 
it I, some of those bands kind of looking back you can kind of see your development through their rec like i can right. like trace my evolution as a producer and songwriter and mixer by looking at the band's records too just because we all kind of came up together or another um definitely one of my favorite and coolest and most eye-opening records i ever worked on was cave in jupiter um and that was also like one of those records where I mean, the first time i recorded them they were 15 you know right and then and then all of a sudden we're making this record together and they track that record entirely live and we're on tape and we're just such fucking badasses i just remember being like holy shit this is like wow we like doing real shit now, <laughs> you know uh so active or inactive is there any band that you would love to work with that you haven't had the chance like that just jumps out uh, um no i don't think i don't think about it like that so i mean i don't like when i listen to bands i don't really think oh i would love to work with right. them i mean i i i like like getting opportunities like to strike anywhere to kind of revisit rework with people that i've like kind of already been involved with for so long is always really really special like hopefully you know it would be fun to kind of reconnect with some of the other artists that i work with a long time ago and then there's also just like a lot of cool new bands um like i'm working on a new praise record right now and that's really cool and i'm doing a lot of mixing and stuff with people i want to do a lot less records mm. now like I don't, um, I like when I was first starting, I would do like 20 records a year. And then yeah. as I became like a real producer, I was doing like eight or 10. And I, I think to be honest, I'd much rather do like two or three right? and work on my own stuff and do a lot of mixing. And it's just, I think that sometimes people don't understand that the lifestyle of like working on a record with the intensity in which i w w you know where a lot of producers work on records you end up giving up a lot of your like you know the hours are hard there's a lot of pressure you know you you're working on something that is like the most important thing in the world for the band that's in there and will live forever so you have to give it a thousand percent you have mm -hmm. to it's not you should not be in the room if you're not doing that and after doing that for 25 years i just kind of realized that like i can't have my entire life be that every day right. you know you so mean, yeah as i say you I, mentioned I, wanting to find time to work on you know some of your or have the time to work on some of your own stuff so do you, we, sh we should maybe talk about some of that own stuff you think <laughs> yeah sure yeah so you just released your band be well just released uh full length the weight and the cost now i want to know did you did you produce and engineer this album like was that was yeah. that all yes. all you on that end mm -hmm. yeah. so what is My what is that experience like working on i mean i guess you've done it in the past with with your bands and stuff but um how does that differ i guess from working with other artists it it took me a long time to figure out how to do it so the funny thing about the be well record is it at first started and it was just um me and the guitar player um mike schleibaum who's in darkest hour is also in be well and we actually had a really hard time finding band members and so we had written a lot of the record and at first we just hired a studio drummer and he came in and was like perfect you know we tracked it and then we kind of like we like tracked we tracked the guitars and the bass and everything and it was like everything felt too pristine and then when i went to do my vocals again i was like trying to bounce back and forth between being the singer and the producer so it was like I wasn't letting myself go and just like, and, and so we finished the record and I was just like, man, this record does not feel right. Like this is a super personal, like intimate record. And this feels like machines are playing it. <laughs> like <laughs> I'd, and we made the like totally terrifying decision to scrap the record and start over. And when we did it the next time we took like, a way um 
we didn't have a drummer yet so the drummer from the explosion andrew black played um uh, he, he tracked a bunch of it and then when we got shane our drummer he 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 did a bunch of it too but we took like a like pretty much like a no editing type approach and when we recorded the guitars and the bass we kept it just like you know we're we've all played for however long if we can't get it in like a couple passes <laughs> there's right. the problem yeah. <laughs> so kind of like took the microscope way away from it and then when i went to track my vocals um instead of like doing a bit and then listening back and doing a bit and then listening back like i just decided that i was going to do like do like four or five takes all the way through and then not listen back like not even like just totally focus on the emotion and the performance and then come back a day or two later and kind of comp put together the takes to make a master take and then if i felt like i could still get something better i would just punch that and once i started doing that i was able to kind of like separate the two things better and i was able to get the performance that i felt like the songs needed um yeah. so it was a learning it was a learning experience but it was really fun and and the the cool thing was like once i got finished with the vocals then i was able to like zoom back out and function as the producer in the way that i would with like another band you know so right. as we're building like the layers and the textures like i kind of like wasn't caught up in like it being my band i was just like able to focus on that and honestly like i had never done like all the battery records and all the ashes records all that stuff was always done in like a few days so none of those things were ever done the way that like i make records with other bands so the be well record is really the first record i ever played on that i was able to like produce in the like put together in the way that like i helped with caution or right or, yeah. you know like curate the songs and do the you know it was so it's fun to have that because i i you know the everything else i'd ever played on was so haphazard mm -hmm. i think the presentation on this record i i kind of described it as like urgent i've also seen the word anxious kind of used to describe the album which i think both of those are pretty accurate and i'd say you managed right. to capture the sound of this is when i when i listen to it and it's a lot of it's in like your your vocal delivery you know tied in with the lyrics i get just kind of like this you capture the sound of like an emotional like drowning almost where right you're scratching and clawing and just trying to like grasp on to something um, right. Which is very fitting for the world we currently live in, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everything yeah. that's going on. I think right. a lot of people are probably going to attach to that. Yeah. No, it's been like, you know, it's funny actually because like, I kind of like wrote this record about feeling like entirely isolated and like alone feeling in the world yeah. and then put it out in the world and have just been bombarded by people being like, holy shit, I feel the exact same way. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. My wife, my wife is a, is a psychologist and she's, she has, I, I'm probably going to get it wrong, but she's always says like, what if we all have a secret and what if it's all the same secret, you know, like, yeah. and I, and I think that, like i think that the be well record is it's one of the things that's like so cool for me is that i, I just feel like you don't need to you know like like everybody talks about oh the mental health aspect of it i don't think you i don't think you need to have like severe depression or struggle with me mental illness to be able to find things that are like relatable you know mm. i think like everybody everybody i know has disappointments and regrets everybody i know like worries about their future and their kids future and you know like i feel like when you kind of put it aside it's just like it's pretty like a especially in this moment in time where um where everything is so upside down and and nobody knows what's coming next i feel like it it, it does fit nicely in the world actually one of my favorite things that came out of it was when i sent the record to thomas from strike anywhere he called me and he was like you know what man it's so cool like our record and your record are like the bookends of this moment you know right. strike anywhere with like the protest and the political aspect and the be well record with the like you know isolation and quarantine you yeah. know <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so yeah it's like it's definitely an emotionally vulnerable record is that something lyrically that comes kind of easy to you is that is that sort of what you look for a lot of times in music when you're listening on your own no um no not really i mean i think that honestly i was like I had given up music entirely, and um, I think I had never quite processed how kind of the hole in my heart that that would leave. And um, I had gotten pretty burnt out on on just the studio, and I hadn't been playing, and I I I, I kind of walked away from it all for a minute, and then. A couple of years into that, I kind of woke up one day and realized that, like, I had really, like, really kind of let myself go mentally. Like, I was in a very kind of bad place and, like, all of the passion and energy I had always poured into, like, producing records or all of the emotion that I had already always gotten out through writing when I was younger. Like, I didn't have an outlet for any of that anymore and I was, like... So a lot of the like kind of mental health stuff that I had struggled with throughout my life kind of all of a sudden had this fertile ground to go wild in and um, kind of found myself like in a really, really dark, dark, dark place, probably the darkest place I've, I've could imagine one being in and it, and really um, it was really in, in a lot of ways start, the first thing that happened was we did got an opportunity to do this battery tour and through the process of that um i just all of a sudden started to feel like a human being again i started to feel like oh my god how i've just you know not just missed i didn't just miss like playing I missed like having a reason to be talking to people. Like my mm. whole world had been music. And when that was gone, I felt like there was nothing <laughs> left for me. And so all of a sudden we're doing this battery thing and I'm talking to the booking agent and I'm looking at t-shirt designs and I have things like on the horizon that I was looking for. And then we wrote a song and literally I sat down and it was the first time I had written lyrics in 20 years of my own, you know? Yeah. And I just, it just poured out of me and it was so emotional and it was so cathartic. And I felt like, I don't care like if I, if this becomes a band or not, but like for my own sanity, I need to just write. And so I started from that point on, I just started writing and writing and writing. And it really was only through writing the lyrics that I e even processed how much pain I was in. And, and, um, it was, it was, um, I don't know, like, I had just numbed myself. Like, I just wouldn't allow myself, like, I had made a decision that I wasn't going to do music, and I had, and I kind of, like, stayed on that track, and I, and I just wouldn't even let myself think, like, hey, maybe this was a mistake. And it really became clear to me that, like, through starting to write and, like, kind of what, there's a lot of common themes through all of it, like, a lot of it came out and I also like my daughter was coming of age and I started thinking like fuck man the only thing in the world that I want for her is for her to never like hide herself from the world and then I kept thinking but what example am I setting where like I have all of this shit that's going on in my head and nobody not even my closest friends have any fucking idea and it was really the combination of all those things that like made me realize like I need to make some like very serious changes in my life. And so I didn't, I quit the job that I had and I decided to go back to doing music full time. And, mm. and that I didn't really imagine be well becoming like becoming such a prominent thing in that, because at that point in time I was just writing riffs and, and lyrics, but as we started putting it together, I realized like, fuck, I really want to play too. I don't want to just produce. I really want to play. And yeah. I feel like, oh, it, anyway, so it's, it's, it's been like a pretty awesome ride and, and really the record, I mean, it really helped me kind of like, like let some things out that I really needed to let out. And also like 
have the people in my life that I'm closest to and my family have a much better sense of like where I am and like who I am in a sense. Yeah. So that's now normally, you know, when a band releases a record, the question, if I were to say what's next, you would say, Oh, well, we're, we're going to tour the record sort of thing. Now we, we live in a world where that's not an option right now. So what, what's kind of on the horizon for either for you and, and for the band right now? Um, well, so for the band, I mean, right now we, we have, um, we have a tour, you know, <laughs> tentatively booked in Europe in, in March Okay, that, that, that the people over there seem to feel that it may happen. I mean, things are a lot more under control there than they are in the right. U.S. Um, but really i really don't know what's gonna happen <laughs> and then and then i have um i've been doing a lot like so i you know i'm i, I want to tour and i want to play it's just like totally beyond our control and I, sure. I think that you're i think europe whether it's march or whether it's later will definitely happen before we're able to play here again just the nature of like trump and yeah how fucked up everything's been um and then on the music side i'm just doing it's interesting i'm doing like a lot of diff like i have certain like the praise record i'm working on i'm only tracking the vocals and then i have some other bands that i'm only doing pre-production with and then i have a couple i'm doing a lot of mixing for people and then i have i, I can't say what it is but i have a very 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 special record that um i just confirmed that right I'm gonna, gonna be doing um in January that is that is an old band that well now we may or may now all of our imaginations are just gonna run wild. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll give you a hint it's that it's a band we talked about. Yeah, today. okay. I think I know who it is then. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway, but but I'm real I'm really excited about that and then and I'm doing a lot I'm just writing a lot and we have like there's like probably six or seven Be Well songs that w were written for the record and mostly recorded that just didn't fit on this record sure. that I'm I'm in the process of finishing. So I, I'm just trying to like stay busy and creative. And then the funny thing is doing the Be Well thing, I got into doing um, a lyric videos. I did. I wanted to do a lyric video for every song on the record. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that, and now I have a bunch of bands that I'm doing videos for. So <laughs> you're just creating work for yourself. <laughs> well, I mean, I just am like, I just am like happiest when I have something to like pour my heart into. Oh, you know, totally I just like, yeah. I just like, like I'm healthier and happier when I have something to think about. Right on. Um, hey, so this this was this was awesome. I'm I'm so glad that you actually agreed to do this. I was thinking about this um, this morning actually, and how random this interview sort of happened because yeah. I think I'd shared on our Instagram about the record, and then I think you had commented and said, "Oh, thanks for the support" or whatever. And then one of our listeners commented and said, "Get him on the show." To which you just <laughs> said, I love "Sounds that. like fun." <laughs> yeah. So it's like the the world well, is the 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 social media world is such a different. It's it's interesting going back to I guess you had mentioned with the fanzines and and pen pals and stuff like that like how you how you could connect with bands there there seemed to be a time there where that sort of disappeared and yeah. then now I feel like with you know Instagram and Twitter and stuff like that that's yeah. kind of coming back around a little bit so yeah thanks again man for taking the time yeah, th to, thank to you chat. thank you well there's family for one thing careers college families everyone knows families don't work college. Most of us couldn't afford lunch in high school. What do you kids do for money? Take bribes off cops.